Bertrand Russell, a mathematician, a scientist, a philosopher, and a publicly professed atheist of the last century, was asked what he would say if, upon death, he found himself standing before the, the majesty of the God in whom he did not believe. Russell responded, I probably would say, sir, why did you not give me better evidence? Theophany is a word that means to reveal or to show. In particular, the unseeable, unhearable, untouchable, unapproachable God revealing himself to humanity. While we may read through the Testament, through the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, while we may read the stories of particular lives of the saints, how God at times reveals himself in very explicit and unmistakable ways, more often than not, he reveals himself in implicit, subtle, and in hidden ways. This is not to tease or to play coy. In fact, it is an expression of his great love for us and the inviolable respect that he pays to our freedom. God loves us so much that he will exhaust every possibility to be known by us. Yet, he will not go so far as to impose upon our freedom to manifest his glory in such a way that we would not have the choice but to bow down and worship. God's hiddenness, the way he comes to us in the flesh 2,000 years ago, the way he comes to us today under the appearance of bread and wine is a tremendous gamble. The risk is that many people most people will pass him by unnoticed, but the reward is that a few will persevere in seeking so as to find and encounter him. Blaise Pascal, also a mathematician, a scientist, and a philosopher, though living 300 years before, would have responded to Russell's objection in this way, that there is just enough light for those who wish to see, and just enough obscurity for those who wish to remain in the darkness. Darkness does indeed cover the earth, and dark clouds the people, not only in the days of Isaiah, but also in our own day. The gospel gives us examples. It juxtaposes those who do wish to see and those who wish to remain in obscurity and ignorance. It is the Magi those foreigners, those pagans, those who seem to have everything, wisdom and gifts fit for a king. They are the ones who realize that they have nothing, nothing but a restlessness, a restlessness born from a question in their head and a desire in their hearts that is causing them to search, to scour the heavens for an answer for some sort of sign that will guide them to that place of rest. They are unsettled with the status quo. They're not satisfied with where they are at. So when that sign finally does appear, they respond with immediacy, unhesitatingly going a great distance, risking life and limb to traverse field and fountain, moor and mountain, to follow yonder star. King Herod, on the other hand, hears news of that same sign, and he is greatly troubled. He can't even be moved beyond the confines of his palace. Still, he is the, not the most troubling of the troubled characters in our narrative today, because we also hear that all of Jerusalem is troubled with him. Now, I get, I don't agree, but I get why the king is troubled. He's at risk of losing his power, his authority, his status, all of his material possessions by this newborn king that is going to rise up and perhaps take his place. I get why he is troubled, but why all of Jerusalem? 
Were they not waiting for this moment for 500 years and before? If we had not asked them just a day ago, are you anxious for the coming Messiah? Would they not have unhesitatingly, with full confidence, said yes? And now they are troubled. Why are they so afraid? What are they afraid is going to have to change in their life when they encounter the Lord? Had they become too comfortable? Had they become too satisfied? Had they become too complacent with their identity as a people in waiting? Where are we in our journey of faith? Or are we on a journey at all? Are you comfortable? You're satisfied. You feeling pretty good about where you are and who you are? Are we standing with King Herod in all of Jerusalem on the day before they heard the news? Or are we standing with the Magi the night before they saw the star? Is there a restlessness in us, a restlessness born of a question in our heads and a desire, a yearning in our hearts, a question and a desire that is causing us to look up at the heavens, to scour the skies for an answer, for a sign? Interestingly enough, desire comes from the words meaning from the stars. And to question, as you know, means to quest, to seek, to search, to ask, to scour, looking for an answer. Desires and questions fuel the fire that is meant to stir within, to stir us, to lift our eyes from staring at the immediate invisible ground at our feet and to gaze upon and even beyond the horizon to look at what is distant and mysterious, recognizing that it is beckoning us beyond where we are, beckoning us beyond who we are. Every day we breathe in an air that is filled with things that tranquilize the soul, that sedate that desire, that suppress those questions within us. The journey of faith begins when we make room for that restlessness within, that restlessness that keeps us awake and alert. When we ask questions, when we are dissatisfied with the status quo, with our daily routine, with that thing that it has always been this way or I have always been this way, the journey of faith begins when we take seriously the challenges that face us each and every day. When we have the courage, the willingness to step out of our places of comfort and security. And when we decide, decide to confront the uncomfortable, the uncomfortable things that are in our life even now, those relationships, those unexpected events, those projects that need to be undertaken, those dreams that need to be realized, those fears that need to be faced, those physical or emotional sufferings from which we cannot run. When we find ourselves in those places, deep within the human heart, we recognize that we stand before the irrepressible questions that cause us to go in search of God. Where do I find my happiness? Where do I find the fullness of life? Where do I find a love that will not dissatisfy or disappoint, a love that will not fade away? Where do I find my name, my identity, my value, my purpose, my meaning, my reason for living? Where do I find my freedom and my place of rest? God does indeed beckon, but he beckons us more with questions than with answers. He beckons us more with desires than the satisfaction of those desires. He feeds us with a, a kind of hunger, a hunger that never fully satiates us, at least not in this world. These are the subtle revelations. These are the pieces of evidence that are meant to, to be presented to us, 
to lead us beyond ourselves, beyond where we are, to go in search of the Lord, to go and search Him, and then when we find Him, to return home by a different way and as a different person.